Welcome everybody. Glad to see you all here with us today. And um, welcome to our Hutch at Home, How Cancer Cell Social Networks Shape Drug Response. We're really delighted to have uh, Taran Gajral, Assistant Professor in Human Biology Division at Fred Hutch joining us today. And I'm Jeannie Chowning, the Senior Director of Science Education and Training at Fred Hutch. And welcome everybody. Um, to our latest Hutch at Home installment. So just a quick reminder, um, occasionally we have people who uh, find their way to us who are not science teachers or students, but just a reminder that this is uh, primarily geared towards science teachers and students, so to please prioritize them um, in the question and answer section. Uh, please mute yourself if you're not talking, especially if you're connecting via a phone. Feel free to add your questions into the chat during the presentation. Um, I'll, I'll be monitoring the chat and um, asking, asking questions during the presentation for you. And also think about questions that you'd like to ask at the end because we'll have some time hopefully then as well. And then uh, there will be a link to a feedback form at the end of the talk so that you can give us your thoughts um, on the presentation and the series overall. And um, we met uh, maybe over a year ago, uh, or within the last year, and I was fascinated with the work that Dr. Gajral has been doing because it is really a big picture view of biology. He is a systems biologist, so he's thinking about a lot of different ways to um, understand how cells interact with other cells. And I think that's actually really a promising area of biology is to kind of think about these larger systems interactions and the complexity of how things um, you know, work in, in living systems. So I'm really excited to welcome him. I'm going to uh, switch over the presentation now and allow him to share. And um, go ahead and, and uh, please uh, get started, Dr. Gajral. Great, thank you, Jeannie. Uh, thank you for also this wonderful uh, introduction to our work as well. So uh, I just want to confirm you're able to see the screen and it is just a one screen. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay. right. You're good. Terrific. Great. So uh, yeah, so what I plan to do is actually uh, our lab has been around at the Hutch for uh, almost three and a half years. And the work that I'm going to show you is all the work from our lab. Uh, that, that has been done here at the Hutch and that uh, nicely shows that how uh, cancer cells interact with other cells in, in our body, especially whole cells and other normal cells, and how that interaction between different cells uh, shapes how cancer is going to uh, grow or die or respond to therapy or move in the body, like how cancer cells make those decisions and how there's a constant interaction or the flow of information and what I like to call it a social network of cancer cells and many other cell types that is going to define what is going to happen to, uh, a, uh, to that tumor. And so uh, just very briefly, a little bit of background about myself. I was uh, born in North India in Punjab and my family moved to, uh, to Canada where I finished my high school in, uh, in the suburbs of Toronto and Scarborough and went on to do a, uh, my college at Queen's University in Kingston where I did an undergraduate in life sciences and mathematics. And in high school, I also joined uh, a Canadian military and I actually stayed as part of the reserve forces throughout the college and also part of my uh, grad school. And uh, actually a little bit, uh, some more background. So my, my, uh, my dad's family is, has all been military personnel. So my, my father was in the Indian military. My grandfather also served in the British military and so did my great grandfather. And my mom's family has been all farmers. So there has not been a, a scientist in my family. I'm actually the first one. And it was a uh, sort of torn between the full-time military versus grad school. That was the turning point in my career. So when, when I was going through uh, working in the lab and in the evening actually uh, getting trained uh, in, in the military. So that, that was uh, during my grad school. And then I chose to stay in science and uh, do my PhD again at Queen's University uh, and then I went on to uh, do a first postdoctoral study at uh, Harvard College, where I switched fields and went into uh, chemistry and chemical biology, where I worked for about two years. 
And then I stayed in Boston and went to the Harvard Medical School, once again, switching fields to uh, systems biology. So throughout my career, I've actually you know, started off with some life science and some quantitative mathematic background, then into more of a disease biology and pathology and biochemistry, then switching over to chemistry and systems biology. So I did get uh, exposed to uh, the different ways of thinking. And that's sort of exactly what I actually try to uh, foster in my own lab. And the work that I'm going to present today is actually done by four very talented uh, individuals from our lab. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Nao Aoki, who has a background in biochemistry. She's a PhD and a, a PhD student in the lab who has a background in math and uh, an undergraduate in the lab who's actually from Seattle, uh, who is now an undergraduate student at MIT, it's Andrew Shu, and a high school student, uh, Sid Vijay, who, who goes to Redmond High, and actually this year he, he's going to be starting at uh, Columbia for computer science. So as, as you can see, you know, if you're trying to address a problem that's a very complex, for example, how cancer cells communicate with other cells and how does that communication, how, how do we actually understand that network so that we can better target cancer cells or design better drugs or smart drugs. You need to bring in information from various different fields that I try to do it for in my lab, for example, mathematics, computer science, uh, biochemistry, biology, all kinds of uh, cross fertilization of scientific disciplines. So very briefly, our understanding of cancer has been evolving. So about 60, 70 years ago, uh, we would define cancer in the clinic by basically the site of origin. This is a lung cancer or a breast cancer or a brain cancer, depending on where we actually discover a cancer. And then as we understood the properties of cancer cells, like how they look like under a microscope, we started to classify them based on a little bit more than just the site of origin. We call it like adenocarcinoma or a sarcoma, but that defines like how these cells look like under the microscope. So that's based on histology. And then in the past 20 years, now we have actually figured out a ways that we can take a tumor out of a patient and do molecular sequencing and look at all the genes and all the mutations that occur. And now we can define a cancer by not just the site of origin, but also by specific molecules. Like for example, this is a lung cancer that has a KRAS gene mutated, which might be different from another lung cancer that has a NOTCH gene mutated. So now we can define cancer more uh, at the molecular level. So however, despite these progresses, the number of patients that respond to any given treatment remain low. And even the patient that initially respond to any sort of treatment ultimately develop resistance. That's because there's still gaps in our understanding of how cancer actually talks to other cancer cells or other cells in the microenvironment. We still don't quite understand the mechanism uh, behind many of the fundamental properties of cancer cells, such as uh, you know, heterogeneity, how one cancer cell, even within the same tumor, is different from other cells. So just to uh, home in on that uh, idea that uh, that we don't quite fully grasp how, uh, how important the cell-to-cell -cell interaction is. These are just very complicated plots, but I want to actually simplify and show you that if we have cells growing on a petri dish in the lab, if we, if we put them in a low crowding condition, which means we only put few cells on a petri dish, they behave very differently if we crowd them with more cells. So cells that have the ability to sense what's around them, how many other cells are around them, what's, what's their nutrient levels are like. So, and that, that affects their fundamental properties and their behavior. So for example, in first plot here, I'm showing the cell cycle. So essentially what it's showing here is these numbers that are highlighted is how many cells are actively dividing. So if you are in low crowding condition, you have about 40% of the dividing. But if you crowd them in the petri dish, then very few cells are going to be, going to be dividing. So they have a way to sense their uh, environment and the nutrients. And based on the sensing, they change their metabolic state. So they stop dividing because they, they figure out that there's not enough nutrients around. Same thing with cell size. If, this, if we put fewer cells in a petri dish, they tend to be much larger, about 40% larger in size. But if you pack a lot of cells, then their size becomes smaller. And the last piece here on the third, uh, on the right shows the drug sensitivity. So if we take a cancer cell from a patient, put it on a petri dish, and put a drug on them, these, and these are different concentration of the drug. So this is a low concentration, medium, and the black one is a high concentration. 
So we can effectively kill these cells in a petri dish if we put them sparsely. So few cells in a petri dish. But if we crowd them, so a lot of different cells in, on the petri dish, then actually we do very poorly. So then none of the cells actually die from a drug, even at a very high dose. And so that essentially, you know, is, 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 is uh, driving the factor that the cells have this uh, unique ability to sense their environment, as well as a uh, way of communication from cell to cell that, uh, that changes their properties, that changes their behavior, not only their physical size or their division, but also how they're going to respond to the drugs. And so that was just an example of cells growing on petri dish where you just have one type of cells. But in human biology, we have many different cell types. So for example, in developmental biology, as you know, developing embryos is going to form into many different cell types. Some of them will form into different organ types. There are many, many, like probably 200 different types of cells that are in, are in, in the body or, or more. And or, or cases like where uh, in, in various states of diseases such as inflammation or, 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 or uh, in, in a diabetes where you have fat cells interacting with other cell types. So it gets very complicated when you have not only the cells that interact with the same cell type, but also different cell types. So you have this vast network of communication going on between different cell types that's going to affect how cells are going to make a decision about their uh, behavior or outcome. So for today's talk, we're going to focus on cancer biology, which what we study in the lab. And uh, from my background, I try tend to think of cancer as this a very complex system. So not just cancer cells focus, but actually looking at it as an entire system. So if you take a tumor from a patient, you see about uh, less than 50% of the tumor is actually cancer cells. So majority are the other cell types that are present in the, in the tumor and also other, other things that are present in the tumor. For example, in the tumor, you have these blue is our cancer cells, but you also have a lot of immune cells, natural killer cells, macrophages, some fat cells, and you also have a lot of fibroblasts that actually support the cancer cells. So many, many different cell types that are present in the tumor. And all of these different cell types, they secrete or they send information. They secrete cytokines and growth factors. So for example, our immune cells are supposed to stop the growth of cancer cells, but somehow this, this network of information between different cell types uh, corrupt the immune cells or the fibroblasts that are surrounding them. Instead of tumor inhibiting, they end up tumor promoting. So there's a constant interaction between different cell types. And these cell types secrete cytokines or growth factors. These are the uh, small proteins that are secreted from these cells that helps the cancer cells grow. And also within the tumor, not the two cancer cells are never alike. There's also heterogeneity. That's what we call when, when things are very different. So when uh, even the two cancer cells are actually not quite the same looking, there could be differences in their genes, differences in their mutation. So there's a, there's a, it's a very, very complex system. So our approach, how, how do we actually study this complex system is actually to, uh, to think of it as, as uh, for example, the properties of cancer cells. So the cancer cells uh, are programmed in a way that they, they need to be able to communicate with their microenvironment. And uh, so for example, they, they need to be able to uh, secrete these enzymes so that makes the way for cancer cells to move because there's a lot of extracellular matrix. So there's a lot of uh, sort of a glue that's surrounding these cancer cells and these cancer cells and secrete these matrix so that allows them to migrate or to invade into the surrounding tissue or to, uh, to form new blood vessels as angiogenesis that allows them to move to a different site. So that's called metastasis. That's why we see cancer actually spread from primary site to other sites. And while doing this, they also need to be able to evade the immune system, to suppress the immune system so they don't get, they don't get killed along the way. And also during this whole process, they also need to be able to evade or resist to the therapy that is actually happening in the clinic, so different drugs that are given to patients. So all of these different features are the functional behavior of cancer cells. And in order to study that as a system, we need to actually uh, not, hand, uh, not tackle this one at a time, but actually study how as a system uh, is, is allowing the cancer cells to be able to migrate or invade or form uh, new blood vessels or proliferate in a new site. So just bringing that information into the lab, 
this is a, a cartoon that actually nicely shows uh, sort of a, a, a timeline and, and in some levels uh, it's still used in the lab, a different model system. So how do we study how cancer cells communicate with other cells? So uh, about you know 70 years ago, the first sort of cancer cell lines were developed. So this cartoon shows from left side to the right side, where as we progress from left to the right, it becomes more complex, which means physiologically it's more relevant. So, which means we are getting more closer to the human system. So in the lab, the most uh, commonly used system is a cell culture, where we take a tumor, we break it apart into pieces, and we take the cancer cells, we grow them in petri dish, and we study their behavior. So that's the most simplest model system we can study. We can put two different cell types in the petri dish and study how they affect each other. And as we can, we can also make these systems more complicated and more relevant to the physiology or the working of our, 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 our body. So we can put them into three dimensional. Instead of a petri dish, we can add some matrix to them so that different cell types will now be more closely interacting with each other. And um, then on the other side of the spectrum, we have model organisms such as mice or, or Drosophila. Those are some common uh, model organisms that are used for cancer biology and for studying cell to cell interactions. And the other ones are then a more human derived. So you take a tumor from a patient and uh, you actually then inject into a mice, you allow that tumor to grow in mouse. And the one that actually I'm going to talk about today that uh, we have developed uh, in our lab uh, and also many others are using it is called a tissue slice. Uh, I like the system because it sort of sits in the sweet spot of cell culture and more human derived. Uh, so there are pros and cons of each of these model systems. So cell culture is easy to do in the lab. You can perturb, which means you can inhibit genes, you can add drugs, uh, but it's very harder to do that in human systems or human derived system. But the tissue slice sits somewhere in the middle where we can make these slices very uh, uh, simply in the lab and allow these slices to uh, to uh, be uh, culture in the lab and then still be able to uh, add drugs or be able to perturb or, or knock down genes in these slices. So essentially what this is, this is actually not something that I, I invented, actually we learned from neuroscience. So neuroscientists in 1960s had figured that if you want to study how a brain works, uh, you don't want to take it apart and put it into small pieces, you will never understand how brain works. So you actually uh, make thin slices of brain. So you take the a mouse brain out and then you make a, you cut it very, very thin slice. And they figure out a way how they can put that slice on a petri dish in the lab and then maintain it, its viability, maintain that slice in the lab for several weeks to several months. And then they study the slice, the behavior of the slice, the electrochemical activity of the slice, and how the neurons are behaving in that slice. So essentially, we've actually adopted the same thing that neuroscientists have been doing into cancer biology. So we don't uh, break the tumor into small pieces. We actually keep the tumor as intact as possible and make very thin slices and uh, pretty much the same kind of concept. So then we can culture these slices in the lab. So now in the slice, you have cancer cells, you have endothelial cells, you have a fibroblast, you have immune cells, you have many different cell types. So you have that social network intact and preserved in a slice that allows us to study how the cells are actually behaving in the context of other cell types. So then now if we add drugs, if we perturb the system, if we, if we now then we can study not just the cancer cells, but also in sort of a, a more native environment, how the cells are going to behave or respond to certain drugs. And with this method, we can also make a large number of slices, so we can treat with different drugs. We can we can keep them uh, in culture for uh, for more than a month, so that also gives us enough window of time to uh, to to study the cancer cell behavior. So this is a uh, another a picture that shows we make actually uh, we get a tumor sample. So I work very closely with some of the surgeons here at the uh, University of Washington Medical Center. Uh, whenever there's a surgery, we get uh, uh, information, and someone actually sits outside and get the tumor uh, back to our lab as fast as possible. And then we make these biopsy punches, and then from them we we uh, use this very high fast moving blade and we cut basically uh, thin slices. And then we keep these slices. On, uh, on a uh, 
on a petri dish that sort of if you don't actually culture the slice directly on the plastic they're actually sitting on uh, another thing we'd call it an insert so it's a membrane insert that floats on the petri dish and at the bottom is a media so the slices get their nutrients from the media through the capillary action and this is what the slice actually looks like and these are all uh, like the cells that are proliferating. That's the KI67 staining, where it has uh, a lot of cancer cells and many other cell types. And you can look at here, this is an ultra electron microscopy image of the slice that shows a lot of immune cells, uh, neutrophils and, and cancer cells, uh, and this is a capillary. So we maintain the 3D, 3D architecture of the tumor intact in these slices. So when we started doing these experiments in the lab, the very first challenge was, when we look at these slices, how do we know what are we looking at? So uh, I'm going to play this video. I don't know if it actually, hope it plays on your end. So this is looking at the slice from top to bottom. So this is a very densely packed cells and then a lot of uh, glue, which we call the extracellular matrix. So if you just look at it under the microscope, you have no idea what, what which one is a cancer cell, which one is an immune cell, and where is the blood vessel. Under a light microscope, it's just impossible to tell. So the first challenge we had was, so this is a, a breast tumor from a mouse, nine days in vitro culture, so after nine days. So first challenge we had to address is, how do we uh, find out what are we looking at? So this is we uh, probably address using an antibody. So antibody is a, is a small uh, protein uh, that, uh, that is a label with a fluorophore that can detect under a microscope. And on the other side, it detects uh, a protein that is specifically present in only one cell type. So then we add the antibody that will detect cancer cells, antibody that will detect T cells, antibody that will detect uh, endothelial cells, microvessels, and these different antibodies had different colors of them. So when we put these antibodies on the slices, and look under the microscope, now all the cells actually light up. So that was nice. And now we can actually see where the cancer cells are and how closely are they interacting with different immune cells or fibroblasts or how are they uh, uh, positioned relative to microvessels or where their cells, cancer cells get their nutrients from. So now, you know, we are looking under the microscope and now, now we know what we're looking at, where the cancer cells are, so we can actually start to understand their behavior. We had a clarifying question in the chat. So are they not submerged, the cells? Can they signal to each other through the media? Can you talk a little bit more about? Uh, absolutely, that's a great, great question. So uh, absolutely, so they can, uh, so in the slice, they can signal to each other uh, through extracellular matrix and through uh, directly secreting. But there's also a way uh, they can also signal a long distance. So basically, they can signal uh, some uh, proteins or secrete proteins that will go into the media, and then eventually those will be picked up by other cells. So it can be both a short-term communication within the slice and also through the media uh, that's a long-term communication. Thank you. So this is actually the same image, but uh, essentially showing CD102, so that's an antibody that detects endothelial cells. So these are the cells that will light up small blood vessels in the tumor. And you can actually see all these cells also nicely forming these structures in the slice. The CD3, which will detect all the T cells. So these are all the uh, T immune cells that are supposed to kill the tumor, but they actually do not, but they become compromised. And then uh, the green ones are here are the cancer cells. And blue is basically all the cells because that's the nucleus, uh, lighting up the nucleus in all the cells. So now looking at the slides, we can see where the cells are. And this is uh, another uh, image that shows that we can not only put antibodies, but also different kinds of uh, labeling techniques, other labeling techniques uh, using uh, a green fluorescent protein. So if we want uh, to label cells with green fluorescent protein, for example, cancer cells, we can also put that on the cell and image. So this is actually an image take, taken on day 34, showing uh, two cancer cells here. I'm going to show you that actually also in the video. So this is a 10-minute video of just focusing on two cells in a tumor slice. And you can see within 10 minutes, they're actually moving a lot. And we were very surprised to see how much movement there is in the slice, because even though they are very densely packed, there's a ton of movement going on in the slice. This is, look at this, a contraction of these lamella on, on these things. And this is the image 
uh, on the right is the video that will show how their nucleus orientation is changing. This is again a 10 minute uh, video. So you can see how their actually orientation is, is changing. That means they're actually moving around quite, quite a lot in a slice. And in, in, uh, initially when we started doing this work, we, we didn't think actually there will be much movement, but there was actually a lot of movement that was observed in the tissue slices, in the tumor tissue slices. So then, okay, now we can make the slices from the tumor. We can uh, light up different cells and we can make nice movies, but then what? So in order for us to study uh, this as a system, how cancer cells behave or respond to therapy or why they don't respond to therapy, we also need a way to deliver drugs to them. So in, in a Petri dish, it's very easy. You just add the drug to the media and the drug diffuses into the cells. Uh, but, in a, but in a tissue slice, we have a three-dimensional. So uh, it, because the tissue slice is about 400 microns, so that's about 20 cell layers. So you have actually one layer, so you have like a, about 10 to 20 cell layers, take a tissue slice. So we have to make sure the drug reaches every cell or most of the cells. So for this, we did some experiments where we use a drug called doxorubicin. And we chose this drug because this drug uh, is actually red and it fluoresces. So if you look under the microscope, you can see where it is or how many cells take up. Uh, and this is also chemotherapy that is given for uh, breast cancer. And we're working with uh, breast cancer slices here. So uh, we figure out a way how to actually uh, put this drug on the slice and within 10 minutes, actually drug goes to almost every cell in the slice. So uh, some few tricks we did in the lab, basically rotating the slice and putting drug on the top and also at the bottom, that helps. So within 10 minutes, you can see here in the red is the drug doxorubicin enters almost every cell in, in the slice. And, and it's actually retained in the cells as well. So now that we have actually established a, a nice system where uh, you're not, it's not a cell culture, where you don't break apart the tumor, we keep this whole social network of the tumor intact in a slice environment and culture it. We can keep them viable so that the cells don't die for at least for several weeks. And we can label different cell types. We can uh, put drugs on them. Now, can we do a drug screen? Or can we uh, screen a lot of drugs and figure out which drug is going to be effective in this tumor slice? So uh, the idea was uh, to compare if we do a drug screen on a tumor slice, which is in this three-dimensional format, or the drugs on, on Petri dish. So we, we actually attempted to do a test the same set of drugs. So we tested about you know, 25 to 30 drugs on the tumor slices and also on cells. So the idea is to actually be able to find the drugs that uh, don't kill cancer cells directly but actually kill these supporting cells. So for example, uh, a fibroblast or uh, immune cells or other things that are helping the cancer cells grow. Because we do exceptionally good job of killing cancer cells in petri dish, but sooner or later they figure out a way to survive and resist and, and develop resistance in, in vivo. And so we figure that testing drugs on slices is more closer to in vivo or more closer to the real world ground truth and uh, if we are able to find drugs that not only kill the cancer cells here, but also uh, drugs that would affect this information flow or, the, or the, uh, the interaction between cancer cells and other cells, that we'll never be able to do if we are just looking at cancer cells on petri dish. Now, there's a challenge here is we cannot uh, test thousands and thousands of drugs is because uh, we only have a few slices. So in one tumor, we could probably make 25 to 40 slices. So that means even if you test one drug on one slice, you can only test 40 drugs. Uh, so if you wanna test hundreds of drugs, what do you do? So this is where uh, we uh, will collaborate with other people in the lab who had some background in computer science and modeling. So we figure out a way that uh, maybe we don't need to test all the drugs. If we know how these drugs work, we can uh, only test few drugs and build a computer model that can actually then tell us how the other drugs will work. So this is the work that actually I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides. But before I do that, I do also want to actually go over a few other uh, concepts. So one is about, so it's not, it's not sufficient to know 
that the drug is effective on cancer cells or tumor slice. We also want to understand the mechanism of why the drug works. Because if we understand why the drug works, we can also figure out why it stopped working or how cancer cells actually uh, find a way to go around the, those important targets and how they actually develop resistance so that we can design perhaps even a combination of drugs or even a smarter drugs. So this is a cartoon that essentially shows uh, how do cells make decisions. I, this could be the cells that are growing in petri dish or cells in a tissue slice. So when we expose them to these external factors like drugs or growth factors or other proteins or anything in the environment or change small thing in their media. So how do they sense these things and how do they make the decision? So, and then how can we actually understand that? So really just to home in on that point is uh, in order to understand how cells make this decision, there are two components to it. So if you imagine, the cell as this uh, automobile or a car. There, uh, there's one thing is you need to know what are the components of the car. So you know what are the essential things in the car. So you have an engine, you have tires, you have transmission, you have windshield wiper. But then that is only one factor to know what's in there. But in order to understand how the car functions, you also need to perturb. So the word perturb means to block or to change things. So for example, if you press on the accelerator, the car moves forward. So that tells you, okay, if you press on the gas, the car moves forward, so this is the important part. Or if you press on the brake, the car stops. Or if you have, if the windows are broken, the car will still work. So that means, you know, the window is not essential to the functioning of the car. So this is exactly what we're actually trying to do in a cell. Try to build first the catalog of all the proteins and networks of things, and then, knowing all what all those parts are, then we need to figure out what are the essential parts that the cells actually need, or for example, these cancer cells need. So that's how we can then figure out how the cells make the decision. So for example, if you press on the gas pedal, the car move forward, or if you uh, mutate KRAS, the cells actually divide uncontrollably, so things like that. So and then another concept is about, now I'm gonna talk about how we're using some concepts from machine learning and computer science to do our drug screening. As I mentioned, the reason to do this is because we cannot screen hundreds and thousands of drugs. We can only screen few drugs. So in an ideal world, you have one drug, we'll have one target, and a phenotype is a bunch of cells and they are dying. But that is an ideal world. What happens mostly is that drug will have several other targets, what we commonly known as like side effects. So now some of those other targets may also change the phenotype, but some will not. So, and if you were to combine this with a whole bunch of other drugs, and the two elements to this, if we combine a lot of different drugs, and if we carefully know how these drugs are affecting their targets, then we can use some fancy math to figure out what's going on to the phenotype. So it's like a game of 20 questions. So each, the answer to each question it gives you, it gives you, uh, it, your, it gets closer to the main answer. So for this, we used a collection of drugs that are approved by the FDA. So this is a, uh, about 40 or about 50 or so drugs that are approved by the FDA for cancer, or different kinds of cancer, uh, starting from about 20 years ago and more recently. And so we took this collection of drugs, and what we did, the first thing is we carefully profiled what their targets are. So essentially uh, building this matrix here. So this drug and what their targets are, and then for the second drug, what their targets are. So we did that for actually 400 drugs. So this, sorry, so this goes from D1 to D400, and these are the targets. So for every drug, we first figure out in the lab, how much does it affect these different targets? Now, having that information was critical because we, we, we now, we, it only has to be done once. It's done once, so now we know all the drugs that are approved by FDA, how do they affect their targets? Now, using that information, now we don't have to screen with 400 drugs. We came up with a shorter list that actually sort of captures what's going on in this area. So now we can only test 30 drugs and that's the idea that because for the tumor slices, we cannot test hundreds of drugs, but we can 25 to 30. So we would do a screen with 25 to 30 drugs 
and then build a, a computer model with some, some mathematics, a linear regression model uh, with some penalty function, and then allow the model to tell us how the other drugs would be uh, would behave. So this is my thumb because now we can do a whole screen in a matter of days because we're only testing 25 to 30 drugs and build a model which takes a few hours and the model will tell us what will happen to 400 drugs. Now we don't have to test all 400 drugs, but we could go back and test some of them to see how our model is working. So we, we applied this to the breast tumor slices and this is like the 25 or so drugs that we tested. Uh, so close to 100 means the drug was not effective at all. And close to zero means drug was very effective. So a starosporin, which is known to be a very dirty inhibitor, it has many, many targets, it's very toxic. So it, it essentially killed the tumor slice. So that's, that was expected. And then some of the inhibitors didn't do much. Now, this is also very important information for us. So if the drug doesn't work, that suggests that the target that the drug is hitting are not important for cancer cells. So it goes back to my car analogy. So using these drugs that are not effective, so which actually tells us that these targets or these components are not important for the movement of the car or for the survival of the tissue slice. So for this method to work, we need some drugs that are very effective, some that are not effective, and some that are medium effective. So if we cover that entire space, we can build a very good model that can predict 89% accuracy of all the other 400 drugs that we have not tested as shown in this plot here. So the red dots are the drugs that we tested and the blue dots are the, the model predicted values. So now we can actually find many drugs which are very effective, but also less toxic. So essentially what this shows is now we can make slices from the tumor and test few drugs and use a computer model to tell us how it's going to, how the response of other 400 drugs are going to be. And now we can go back to the lab and test that model. Right, so far, so clear, I guess, okay. So then um, we, we did this in a mouse tumor. So we wanted to see how uh, our predictions are in a human tumor. Because you know, mouse tumor is different from human tumors, so, and also within the breast tumor, there's the different types of breast cancers. So we look, we're looking at this kind of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer, but there is uh, no targeted therapy approved. It's mostly chemotherapy, and so now our model does uh, a little bit poorly, about 65 percent accuracy, because the model was built on, built on a mouse tumor, but still not bad. So these are all the drugs that we predicted would be effective and they were somewhat effective, so the, the values are closer to zero. And these are the drugs that we predicted would not be effective, so that they were not effective in killing the slice viability. So that is also important. So, it's, so both predicting drugs that are going to be effective, and also drugs that are not going to be effective. Because if you predict the drugs that are not going to be effective, you can also spare uh, the tumor or the patient from all these uh, uh, side effects. So it, uh, those, the drug is predicted to be ineffective, so you wouldn't actually want to use it in the clinic. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm just gonna walk you through uh, maybe two uh, examples of a uh, of few drugs that we found in our model. So here showing four drugs. These were predicted to be ineffective in cancer cells on petri dish. So the numbers are 100%. That means if we put these drugs on cancer cell and petri dish, the cells grow up to 100%. They do not die. But all of these drugs, all of these four shown here in red bars, were predicted by our model to be inhibited in tumor slices. So not in petri dish in culture condition, but on a slice where the cells are surrounded by other cell types. So somehow our model is predicting that if the cancer cells are surrounded by other cells, these drugs are going to be more effective. And we actually tested them and showed that that is indeed true, that these drugs were more effective in the tumor slice, but not in, to, in, in a petri dish format. And then we also did test them in human PDX models, human derived PDX models, and confirmed that it is true. So now we want to understand why these drugs are killing the tumor slice, but they don't affect the cancer cells. So we want to actually understand what is going on what do these drugs target so that they are actually uh, 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 decreasing the viability or the growth of the tumor slice? So we, we tested them in mice and both of these scenarios, we showed that 
that um, if you put uh, these cancer cells in mice, then they form a tumor and tumor grows. And then if you treat them with the drug here in the red, the tumor grows much, much slowly, and the tumor weight is much, much smaller in both of these drugs. So again, homing in the point that, for example, this drug, Duramapinot, which does not change the growth of cancer cells in petri dish, even at a very high dose. This is a very high dose. It does not change the growth or in 3D environment. So this drug does not kill cancer cells, but somehow it is killing the cancer uh, cells in the slices. It, it is somehow impacting the social network, and we want to understand how it is doing that. So what, what we did was we actually took the slice and uh, ground it up and took out all, all the uh, mRNA and sequenced the mRNA because we want to see what this drug targets at the molecular level. Now we found that when we treat with this drug, there are 78 genes that are decreased. There are a few that were increased. And when we look at what those genes are, these genes are all ECM genes, which, which I call uh, which we call extracellular matrix genes. So when we treat with Duramapi node, all of the many of the ECM genes are decreased. Now these are the genes or these are the proteins that help the tumor cells survive, that helps to support the tumor. So this is called ECM, so extracellular matrix. So there's a, these are the different roles of extracellular matrix in the, in the tumor. So it provides that structural support. It actually provides that glue that, that keep all the cells uh, in, in that, in, in the, it, it retain their structural support and also preserve the growth factors that are being secreted by different cell types. And it also provides nutrition for different uh, cells uh, and also a structural barrier for drugs or other kind of things. So this ECM is very important for cancer cells to survive or for a tumor to grow. So somehow this drug, the Ramapinot, is uh, inhibiting the extracellular matrix. And then we look at those genes that are decreased by Duramapinod in the tumor, and we found they're actually mostly expressed in the tumor, but not in cells. So tumor means slices, but not in cells, which makes sense because when we put cells on a petri dish, there's essentially just cells on a petri dish in the media. So there is no extracellular matrix, so the drug would not work because the drug only targets extracellular matrix. So that actually makes sense now how the drug is working by targeting the support structure that is surrounding the cancer cells. So you can imagine if you had done this screen just on cancer cell, you would actually miss out on this drug, which is a very uh, important drug that actually targets the support structure. So this would be effective as we have shown in mice. Uh, but if you had done this screen just on cancer cells in petri dish, you would not discover this drug. And then we, we go on to show that also in, in culture conditions. So if you take cancer cells, here we label cancer cells with green color, GFP, and we put them on a petri dish and we don't give them any media. So we'll give them some media, but no supplement. So we don't give them any growth factors and they don't grow. This is the black bar here. But if we do the same thing, there's still no media, but we put them together with this another cell called a fibroblast. So fibroblasts are the cells that are present in uh, uh, many tissues and also in the tumor that secrete this ECM. So extracellular matrix is predominantly secreted by fibroblasts. So if we put these two cells together in the petri dish, but still don't give them any growth factor, somehow they're able to communicate and secrete the growth factors and able to survive for many, many days in the petri dish without any growth factor. That's incredible. So essentially saying that this communication between the fibroblasts and cancer cells is sufficient that it allows the cancer cells to survive, even providing them any exogenous or external growth factor in a petri dish. And then when we add this drug, Duramapinol, at different doses, we can decrease their growth. So that essentially proves a point that Duramapinol works by targeting the fibroblasts and extracellular matrix that allows the cancer cells to grow. It actually shows nicely here uh, uh, in this cartoon, we have this green cancer cells, uh, which uh, uh, and interact with the cap, this is the cancer-associated fibroblast. So the cancer cells first secrete some growth factors or come in physical contact with them, and that allows them to change some of the signaling proteins as shown here. I, would, I didn't get into much detail of those, but 
there's an interaction between cancer cells and fibroblasts that allows the fibroblasts to secrete this extracellular matrix. And that matrix then supports the cancer cells. So there's a constant flow of information and interaction between these two cell types that allow cancer cells to survive or to uh, grow, even in very uh, nutrient deficient conditions. And if we come in with a drug that blocks some of these signals, so now the ECM production is decreased, then the cancer cells are not able to survive or actually reduces their growth. And then, so I showed you how duramabinod works. Very briefly, I'm going to tell you how tivozinib works. So this is a drug, again, does not kill cancer cells, well, almost 100% prediction by our model and measurement by our, our experiments, but it does kill the tumor slices. And long story short, it turns out there are these micro vessels that I showed earlier in some of the images. So tivozinib targets these micro vessels. It doesn't target cancer cells, as seen here. So you see many of these purple microvessels are virtually gone from this from these tumor slice. So by targeting these microvessels, which provide nutrient to the cancer cells, uh, tovazinib is effective at reducing the, the growth of the cancer cell. So again, this, in this scenario, tovazinib work by targeting the interaction between microvessels or endothelial cells, which make up these microvessels and cancer cells. And so just to summarize, we actually established a very nice system in the lab, uh, basically adopting uh, some things from other uh, fields such as neuroscience and looking at uh, how we can uh, study the system as a whole or keeping the, the social uh, network or the interaction of different cell types intact. So that is much more closer to the physiology and be able to use that system in a matter of days and combine it with some computational modeling allow us to screen a lot of drugs that we would not be able to actually find with traditional methods. And I just showed you two examples how we found drugs that targets the support fibroblast or the microvessel. And uh, both of these drugs now, we're actually pursuing testing them in additional models in the lab. And also using this whole system as not just testing on a mouse tumors, but also a tumor from a patient and testing few drugs in the lab in a matter of a couple of days and being able to go uh, inform the surgeon and say, you know, these drugs actually are effective in this tumor or these are not effective can, can have a much more uh, meaningful impact in, uh, in, in something we call precision medicine. So basically uh, appearing a, a tumor to a specific drug. And some of the future things that we are doing in the lab is now we're looking at uh, not just the primary tumor, which means where the tumor is formed, but also as when the tumor uh, migrate in the body or move in the body and spread to the other parts, it also changes its behavior. A tumor that's growing in the lung is different than a tumor growing in the liver. So we can make slices from a lung tumor and a liver tumor and treat them with different drugs and see which drugs are going to be more effective in lung versus or liver, and then also be able to figure out what allows these tumor in different environment to grow. So looking at more molecular understandings. Uh, so I do have a couple of slides, but I think I'm getting pretty much close to the time. So uh, I'm going to ask Jeannie uh, for some input here should be. Yeah. I think we, we I think we could go to questions. Um, okay, because uh, unless there was something, yeah, something else you want to show the acknowledgments. Sure, let's let's. Uh, sure. So this is our, our lab, and uh, actually, if you, uh, if you work hard, you also play hard. This is some of our lab events, We're going for a hiking, puzzle break, and some of our lab trips. So we're happy to take any questions. And uh, we also thank um, two, two of your uh, grad students worked with SEP teacher yes. uh, in the past. So we also appreciated that, which is great. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to open it up to questions. So you can either put your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself um, if you'd like to ask your question directly. And um, uh, while we're waiting for, for folks to potentially add some questions into the chat, I was kind of wondering about how you deal with kind of variability in patient tumors. So how, you know, consistent are the results across different patient samples, for example? Uh, that, that's a, a fantastic question. Uh, it, it's, it's been a challenge and actually 
there uh, is a project in the lab actually studying exactly that. It's called the heterogeneity within the tumor and also from patient to patient. Um, so, uh, you know, this is something, it's much easier to be done with the mouse tumors and we are using them as an example, but uh, the patient tumors are going to be a whole different challenge as well. So, uh, so the different ways of looking at it. So uh, clinically with a few different biomarkers, uh, that's how most of the clinical decisions are made. So patient's tumor can be sequenced, so we can look at what mutations they have and how similar are they uh, uh, to other uh, patients of the same cancer type. Or the other way that we are looking at is, is not looking at specific mutation. We're looking at functional response. So we don't, we don't actually care what underlying mutations are. We want to know whether their response to the certain drug is the same or not. And that is, uh, is a challenge on its own. So we found, you know, so we've been working with some liver cancers in the past two, three years. So we do see some consistent response, but there, you know, every now and then we do get a tumor that actually does not respond. And then we try to figure out, uh, you know, there's some sort of failure analysis why this particular tumor didn't respond. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's just a technical, so which means that uh, either the tumor size wasn't big enough or we didn't get the viable the tumor part or the part that we got wasn't uh, quite the right type or representative of the tumor or sometimes it's actually uh, more than just a technical it could be that the tumor has some underlying uh, pathway or something that actually prevent this drug from act from working yeah. so it, it, it's a it's a it's a big challenge of looking at uh, heterogeneity but i'm hoping that with the methods that we are developing uh, where we're actually combining this sort of testing drugs on directly on the patient's tumor and come yeah. with a computational model that over time we will actually have enough data to be able to have a more predictive model that will take into account of this heterogeneity. Is, is the goal to be able to potentially in the future take someone's tumor sample and you know, be able to uh, test it a little bit and then kind of predict which drugs are best for it? Absolutely. So uh, I, I work with uh, liver surgeons. So for a liver cancer, there are about six drugs that are approved. And uh, talking to my colleagues, they essentially, they, there is no correct or, or, or wrong way of knowing which drugs to give. But, you know, it's not, it's like antibiotics. You cannot, you know, there's unfortunately with a cancer patient, you cannot keep on testing. If the first drug doesn't work, you try the other one or then you try the other one. So, you mean, you know, your first drug is, is very important that you actually prescribe. So having this bit of extra information can be very, very useful to even rule out that these drugs are not going to work. So why don't we actually try something else? So that's, that's essentially the goal. And we have, we have been doing it actually for the past uh, year and a half. So you know, for, the, for us to make this as a, a more standard test or, or get it even approved as a way of uh, doing precision medicine, we just need more data and more time saying, we have actually applied this approach to X number of patients, and then we followed how those patients responded on our recommendation and, and actually sort of build a sort of a case for this test. That's really interesting. So that you're already doing that a little bit with liver patients, liver cancer right. patients. Right. Um, there's a question in the chat. What information would you like to add to your model to make it more accurate, if anything? Absolutely. So uh, we, if we could uh, also get some molecular information, that would certainly make it more accurate. So our drugs are targeting proteins. So if we know what proteins are present in those uh, tumors beforehand, because most of the time we find that information afterwards. Mm. But if, we, if, if there is a biopsy that was done and someone had uh, figured out or did some kind of a test to know these are the proteins that were present or these are the genes that were mutated, having that information added to the model would certainly make it more and more predictive and accurate. Mm -hmm. Danielle, did you have a question? Uh, sure. I, I was um, wondering how specific those drugs are. So if you have to, I may, I may have missed this in your talk, but do you have to deliver them right into that tumor or do they affect um, extracellular matrix in other places too? Yeah, so, so most of the drugs that we're using, uh, so about 50 of them are FDA approved. Uh, 200 are various different clinical trials and other 200 are tool molecules, which are mostly used in, in the lab. Uh, so they are they they vary in their specificity. So 
So some are very specific, some are actually very non-specific. So to do our screen, we tend to use non-specific drugs because we want to hit as many targets as possible. Um, but you know, to answer your question about, uh, for example, Jarama, we know that targets this extracellular matrix. So in the lab, when we test on a slice, we just add that drug right on top of the slice, so it just goes to the tumor. But when we do test this drug in, say, in, in a mouse, then it is delivered through uh, either IV or intraperitoneal, so it will go through the bloodstream and will probably go other places as well. Uh, so the, these. So 50 of these drugs are FDA approved, so they have gone through the safety trials in, in the humans. So we, we, even though we built a model based on 400 drugs, uh, when we say go for a recommendation or uh, testing drugs in mice, we tend to go for the drugs that have passed the safety profile because that gets us closer to, or the drugs that are currently in the basis of clinical trial. So for drama we know it's possible that it would also target fibroblasts other places, not just cancer cells. But, uh, but the fibroblasts are also very resilient population. But we, we suspect that they are, because of targeting fibroblasts, the neighboring cells that are mostly going to be affected will be in the tumor cells. I have a question because I know a couple of the students on the line are really interested in computational biology. And you were kind of coming out of also you know some uh, intelligence services and kind of thinking about mathematically and um, mm -hmm. can talk about for students who might be interested in computation uh, and, and biology, like what you see as good directions for them to go or, you know, what, what you would recommend. Absolutely. So uh, I, I actually have two high school students right now who are both computer science and uh, uh, or, or intend to also pursue a computer science major in college. And so what we try to do is, um, uh, if you have an interest in biology and computer science, then uh, and you make yourself worse in some programming language, and uh, you could start with some online tutorials or things like that, but mostly it's going to be a machine learning. So in biology, these days, it's very easy for us to collect large amount of data. Uh, so within a matter of days, you could end up with gigabyte, terabytes of data. And then some important questions. So for example, in our lab, we're looking at, you know, responding drugs, uh, tumor responding to drugs or not responding to drugs. So we have a large amount of data. And, uh, and if we can couple that with some machine learning approaches or building some computational models, that it's just very easy to collect data, but very hard to make sense of it. So we're employing some computational tools, some starting with simple regression model to nonlinear neural networks, or some more sophisticated uh, CNN uh, models uh, to be able to help derive a hypothesis from the data. So it's because we, we can't actually see many things just by staring at the Excel sheets. So we are hoping that, you know, in the lab when the student work together with the senior scientists, so they provide them a more context of what the problem is, what the data set is, and uh, then what we are hoping to achieve and develop some hypothesis. So build a model that will have some prediction and we take that prediction back into the lab and test. So I would, I would encourage uh, anyone who's actually in that area, have interest in the area to, you know, you can email me or connect with anyone in our lab and, uh, and we can, you know, talk about different things that we have done in the lab or many times we also look at publicly available data sets. So, for example, you know, Cancer Genome Atlas has published sequences of 10,000 patients. So, actually, one of my high school students just published a paper uh, in translation science where we did just that. We took, we looked at 10,000 patients of their sequencing data that was available publicly, and we analyzed that data and made some hypotheses. And then Dr. Brian Chen in the lab went to the lab, actually tested some of those hypotheses. That's great. Um, we are just about out of time. So, um, if could, everybody could uh, either type your appreciation in the chat or use your reaction buttons or um, you know, show your video and, and wave uh, your, your thanks for this um, fascinating talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Gajal. I really uh, enjoyed learning more about your work. And I just want to remind everybody that um, the schedule for Hutch at Home is on the SCP website and that next week, 
We hope that you'll come back. We hope this is standing on your calendar um, that every Tuesday at four you're joining us. But um, Raquel Sanchez, who's the managing director of global oncology, will be talking about a global mindset, turning my lived experience into my life's work. And um, sh there she is in front of the Uganda um, Cancer Institute, which is a partnership with Fred Hutch. And so you'll learn more about um, what Fred Hutch is doing in other parts of the world. So I hope you can join us then. And um, thanks so much. Here's, I'm gonna just quickly uh, put into the chat the feedback link if you um, have some feedback for us. And it's also on this QR code here. And um, I'll be hanging out for a few minutes afterwards um, if, you, if you wanna touch bases. Thanks to all the students and teachers who joined us today. And thanks again to our speaker.